This is Len. Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles on May 22nd, 2020. I am coming to you as usual from Ocean Park, Maine, looking out at fairly calm sea tonight. It's a shimmering light. It's what time is it? Seven, almost eight p.m. and still plenty of light. The the days are getting longer, and each day the sunrise comes a minute or two sooner, and the the sun kind of edges over to the left as I look out this window along an area called Prout's Neck, and it's moved quite a bit in the two plus months that we've been here uh, in Ocean Park. This week's interview is with Darlene, and she was last on the show uh, shortly after we got up here at Ocean Park in March, and so it gave us a chance to talk about uh, the pandemic, the new puppy, uh, the new original Oasis, which listener Al Dimmitt sent to her after she talked in the last uh, conversation that she wished she could abandon the paper white and go back to the original Kindle, and Al sent her one, so you'll hear how she likes that. For news, I want to talk about reports of a color e-paper, e-ink, and whether or not that's really going to affect the Kindle. And I've got a couple of tech tips, and I want to catch up with some of your comments. So let's get started. The news story I want to talk with you about this week uh, came to me from Dan Campbell. He sent a post by Michael Kozlowski on the Good E-Reader blog. It had a provocative title, The Amazon Kindle is Doomed Unless It Uses Color E-Paper. This was from May 18th. You know, uh, Michael Kozlowski has excellent sources in uh, the E-Ink. Uh, he quotes an engineer at E-Ink and uh, he has seen some of this new color e-ink technology, and he's following how it is being uh, introduced by competing e-readers. So this is a real thing, and he's quite a crusader for the fact that this is going to change everything. And that's where he, he makes these statements saying that if Amazon doesn't adopt this new technology, that it is somehow going to really slip in competing against other e-readers. The new e-ink uh, is it's called print color it, it also goes by the name Kalido K A L E I D O and in looking at some of the videos it certainly looks better color than what I saw 10 years ago at E Ink when they had sort of demonstrations of it that just seemed like such a pale color it it, it was hard to imagine it was ever really going to be necessary or and also it was quite expensive so i assume that the price has come down in that period of time it is brighter and i can imagine that uh, if you had a, a kindle you know like a paperwhite or an oasis and there was an option for color i'm sure it would be attractive and i think it might be pleasant when i'm reading on a screen on the ipad or or the fire i like to go to the sepia color and uh, if there's any photographs or any kind of graphics in a book, it is nice to see them in color. But Michael's concluding statement here, I think, is a little bit of a stretch. He writes, if Amazon does not do a color e-reader for at least one more product cycle, such as no new color Kindle in 2020, this might be the final nail in the coffin to drive casual users to competing brands that do have color. Uh, interesting term casual users I, I, I maybe he means users who who don't have a thousand kindle books in their library like i do that have such an investment in the kindle platform uh yeah if you just now are thinking maybe i'll try this ebook thing and you, you, there's one device that has color e-ink and the other doesn't uh I, maybe there could be some kind of small advantage but i think going against that is the huge advantage that Amazon has with Kindle Unlimited and the content and uh, Amazon Crossing, the, the whole uh, pipeline of content that is available for Kindle, uh, I think offsets the, any idea that there's going to be some kind of rapid shift just because of uh, the technology. The other thing that, you know, and this is speaking as a user, I, I, I don't pretend to rival the 
uh, technological experience that Michael has in covering the story. But as a user, I like my Oasis, and I like reading it here at the beach. I like reading it at night. I like the black and white screen. There's just something about it that sort of dials down the intensity of my reading, and it's restful, and it's very pleasant. During the day, I frequently read. I've got a new iPad Pro, and, and I love reading books on that. It's It's just a very thin screen and everything's bright and if there are any links I can click on them and the other place where I get beautiful color of course is on my iPhone uh, and also the fire tablet so the idea that I'm going to you know abandon the whole Kindle platform because the uh, basic Kindle the e-ink screen doesn't have color when there's so much color available through other devices I, I just don't I can't figure that out it, it certainly wouldn't be uh, anything that would tempt me, even if I were less invested in the whole Kindle platform than I am. But I, it, it's interesting to see this technology uh, coming as far as it has. Now, one thing in one video that I saw did interest me is it looked as if you could draw in color on this new e-ink screen. And I think that would be a huge thing for the Remarkable tablet, which I up till, up till I get this iPad Pro, uh, I preferred writing my notes and doing creative work uh, on the Remarkable because it felt so good, the, the way the pen slides across it. It doesn't have that glassy, slick feeling that I have when I'm using the Apple Pencil and the iPad Pro. Well, if, if the Remarkable or a competing tablet could come out and you could draw and, and do your drafting with the possibility of color, that would be pretty cool. So, you know, it, it might be something that really does keep that technology in the running, uh, combining the tactile pleasure of drafting on that tablet with the possibility of, of having color. So definitely worth uh, following, and thanks to Dan for sending me the link, and we'll, we'll see. I, I, I doubt that... I, I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if a high-end Oasis does come out with color, and perhaps this year, and uh, so we'll see. It's, it's something to watch, and uh, if it does come out with color, maybe it be an event that I actually get to go to in person if, if we're in, in the, the time when people do anything in person anymore. Maybe I'll be doing a attending an Amazon Zoom product launch uh, in the fall. That would be kind of fun. In the tech tips last week, I said that I had an Apple Smart Keyboard Folio for iPad Pro 11-inch to give away, and the winner is Garrett Riley. Uh, he sent me an email that I received Saturday morning, the day, the morning after releasing the show, and it got here at 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that means that he sent it at 5.15 a.m. California Time, so he was up bright and early listening to the Kindle Chronicles, and as a result, he was the winner of the keyboard. And uh, this is I uh, was making it available because I've, I got the Magic Keyboard to go with the iPad Pro, which came out after this uh, smart keyboard. Uh, second, uh, First runner-up was Wade Jarvis. I heard from him at 12.08 Saturday morning, and second runner-up was Ozzy Mickey D. I got an email from him on May 21st. So I'm sorry I didn't have three of them, and I'm, I'm glad uh, three of you were able to respond. And, and Garrett, I hope you enjoy your, your new keyboard. This is a reply to a question I got from Mark Icero in California. And he said, he, uh, I can no longer share Kindle highlights to Twitter. And he's using an Oasis, not the latest version of Oasis, but not the first one either. Uh, and he said that he would highlight a passage, he'd choose Goodreads, and then he got a message, unable to retrieve your social network settings, please try again later. Uh, now, I... Uh, I did this uh, on my Oasis, and I got the exact same thing that Mark reported. It was uh, forcing me to tap on Goodreads, and then I got the message saying that uh, the social network settings weren't right. And I went to settings, and my Facebook account looked like it was linked, and, and there was no mention of, of Twitter. So, you know, even if there uh, had been an option there, it just it, it didn't seem like it worked. Uh, I, I tried calling uh, Kindle support, and this would have been at uh, uh, 6.35 p.m. tonight, uh, Friday night. And for the first time, I think, I've ever reached out for technical support from Amazon. I got a recording uh, saying, talking about COVID uh, virus and uh, all, how all hands on deck are for 
trying to work on keeping the workplace safe and, and addressing the virus. And it ended with your inquiry cannot be answered at this time. And that was it. <laughs> Sorry, Charlie. Uh, you know, you get used to 24-7 help quickly, and then uh, it's a measure of the stress on the whole system here that there wasn't anybody that could answer my question. I might try, uh, well, regular business hours, so that might be the thing to try. So what I did in the meantime is I, I thought that I was able to share highlights with Kindle for iPhone and my Fire tablet. So I, I went in just to test that tonight to make sure that was working. And, and indeed it was. And I find this to be really a, a fantastic feature of the uh of the tablet and it works on the iOS and I assume it's working on the Android. I think Mark's right that it used to work on the e-ink Kindles. And I don't know if there's been some kind of a change on that, that I will try to find out. But if you're not familiar with how this works, if you're reading on say your iPhone and you highlight a passage and you think, boy, the world really has to see this and you have a Twitter account or you have a Facebook account, you can simply tap on share and and it creates a nice little post uh and for twitter it it creates a post that has the quote that you're quoting from your book and it gets published on the twitter feed with a an attractive cover image from the the cover of the book and then you can add something about it in your tweet so it, it's all very easy to do and and i do it from time to time maybe once or twice a week i'll be reading something and think well i think this will add to the conversation among my my twitter followers and it's just so easy. It's it's so uh, it's one of these magical things you can do on the Kindle, uh, which I I haven't gotten over yet. I'm I'm casually reading along, and then with a few flicks of my Apple Pencil or my stylus, uh, I can send a quote that I like to. Uh, I think my Twitter feeds up to six thousand people, and they're not all hanging on every word I put up. But uh, it really is a nice way to to connect with. Uh, it, 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 it's an active reading method that I really enjoy. And I also enjoy making highlights, to be sure. Uh, when I tried it on uh, uh, sharing to Facebook, it, it, it didn't create as quite as, as attractive a post uh, and uh, as it did in Twitter. And then the other thing you can do both on the iPhone and the Fire tablet is I can email a quote. And I've done that, you know, I've come across something about education and I want my daughter Sarah to see it or her partner Josh. I can just do that same thing, highlight the quote and then tap uh, the share thing. And the next thing you know, it's off as an email to them and they can read it. And then when these show up, it, there's a, a nice sort of end to the sharing because you get a page that describes the book. It says, this quote is from this book and it's showing a, a little image of it. And then there's a place where you can start reading that book f for free. I, I assume it's the initial sample. And then there's a link where you can buy the book and it says how much it would cost. So it's very actionable information that is put in front of people using the social media sharing that someone wants to uh, share a quote. They're not necessarily wanting to sell books for Amazon, but that's Amazon is smart enough to make that a possibility. And if somebody thinks, well, this is a smart quote, and maybe the rest of the book is that smart. Uh, so I, I love it. And uh, there is a mystery as to how come it's, it's not available now on the Oasis. <music> Time now for the interview. Uh, sat down with Darlene and our new puppy Sophie yesterday, May 21st, on the front porch down on the first floor overlooking the dune grass and the ocean. Uh, she she loves sitting out there even when it's pretty chilly. I think earlier in the week it was in the 50s, and I just bundle up and we go out and have coffee there in the sun. And this time I brought my iPhone and I brought the iPad. I recorded on both of them, and the quality that I got in voice memo from the iPad was much better than from the iPhone. So that's what you'll be hearing, and you'll be hearing some ambient noise from the ocean and some birds. And uh, I think there's a little growling from Sophie, the puppy, uh, in this conversation as well. The last time I had Darlene on the show was March 28th. That was 55 days ago, so a lot has changed since then. And that was just two weeks after we had arrived here in Maine from Cambridge. 
she, it, as I said, she had mentioned that she wished she could go back to the original Kindle Oasis. And so when Al sent one, Al Dimmitt, uh, that was really a nice thing. So I began by asking her how she liked the the retro o- Oasis. This was the one that, you know, it had the battery half in the cover, then half in the main thing. And she she liked it because it had buttons and it was a small screen. And, and she doesn't like the larger Oasis that I use, so... She, she's as, as you'll hear, she's a happy camper, and thanks Al for for making that possible. I like that you just push the buttons and you it changes the page. <laughs> you like that physical <laughs> button? Yeah, it doesn't do weird things on me like the other one did. So yeah, no, I love it, and I like how small it is, and mm-hmm. I, I think it's wonderful. You don't mind the funky design that has the battery half in the case and half in the Kindle? No. It doesn't bother me. I keep a case on all the time, so yeah, that's how I always have done it. So I'm very happy with that. And you were reading on a paperweight before, right? Right. And you didn't like that because you had to tap the screen. There. Well, it's okay, but um, if the screen got tapped or something, I don't know. It seems like things would happen that yeah. when you just have to push the button. Right. And I like how you can turn the screen either way and then have buttons on either side, and mm-hmm. um, that you can. I can make the bottom button is the easier one for making the page yeah, move forward. Yeah, I think we made that switch so that we reversed it. So when you click right. the bottom button, it goes next. Yeah, so that's all really nice. Yeah, and it's the same size screen as the Paperwhite, actually. It's oh, really? It's a six-inch screen, yeah. The Oasis that I have has got the seven-inch screen, so it's a bigger screen, but oh. you never use that anyway. You didn't have the new Oasis, I don't think. Oh. I don't know. I have another one, but yeah, I thought this the other the screen on the other one was bigger, but yeah, it doesn't matter. I just like the smaller screen, and yeah. even though I do my print a little bigger, it doesn't. I just have to push the button more often, but right. it doesn't bother me. Yeah. Cool. Oh, Sophie's escaping. She likes to go to a different part of the porch and eat wood chips, and that doesn't do well with her little two-pound body and digestive system. Come on, Sophie. She's now trapped in the webbing. <laughs> well, in the pause, I'll describe the scene here. It's a beautiful sunny day. I think it's going to be 70. We've had such chilly weather since the last time we talked with Darlene. And so clear skies and 70. There could be a long bike ride in our future today. But not much wind right now. Not no much wind. wind. The flag is just Go for straight a bike down. Right now. There's a surfer out there in the... Uh, well, that might be a paddle, paddle board. board. Yeah. He's that water's got to be cold. I, He's I, got a wetsuit on. It can't be more than 50 degrees. The other gadget that uh, we're both using here are iPads. What What's your experience with the iPad been so far? You know, I've only used the iPad to um, Zoom or to read books to the kids. Uh-huh. Well, I guess that's Zoom, too, but, I mean, specifically that way. That's the only thing I've really used it for. But, I mean, I, it's been great. Yeah. Why Why do you like it better for Zoom than just using your MacBook Air? I can just take it anywhere. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I suppose I could be using my MacBook Air, but I don't know. It just, I like how I can move it around and, um, yeah. it just seems to. It seems friendlier. I mean, it yeah. seems like it's not a computer. It's just this tablet it feels kind of like a magic tablet it doesn't have a keyboard or anything it's just the person talking to you yeah sophie uh and uh you've been making masks i made a bunch of masks yes that was nice and i'm taking a break and organizing fabric and i'm gonna work on some collage pieces that i've got started and some other projects so, yeah. Did you bring a bunch of fabric up from Cambridge when we went down that day? I did. I brought a huge bin, probably, I don't know, three feet high or something, <laughs> <laughs> and three feet wide. And I had, it was all stuff that has, um, through the move and everything, it's just got shoved in there, and it needed to be all folded correctly and um, organized. And so I've been ironing for several days now, and I think by the end of today I'm hoping to have it so that all in neat little stacks and uh, yeah I was surprised I thought that I see these folded rectangles of fabric and I always thought that they were just like a rectangle 
but you explained that they can actually be uh, in different shapes, but they just end up folded that way when you're storing them. Well, right? I have to make stacks so that I can, you know, stack them on my shelves and um, have access to them. So right. it's to make them uniform. It just helps to. And then I can stack them by colors. And, and then how will you use them when you're making a, a quilt? Well, you'll just pull them out when you need that color and unfold it and use what you want and fold it back up and put it back. Are the colors arranged in some sequence so that you're going to the blues or the greens or the reds? Well, yeah, they'll be stacked by colors, just like the color wheel, and so you'll have access to... Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it'll, it, it works well for me. and. Um, some of the big flowered stuff that's multicolors, I'm going to just um, stack that separately because you grab a piece of fabric, it has, you know, five, ten different colors in it, and you don't know what you're looking for, so... Um, you might take just one piece of that for a quilt of a fabric? No, for a collage, I might want to take a certain little piece and cut out, oh, I see. but right. it's hard to do those by color because mm -hmm. there's there's so many colors in them so anyway and it's a certain um, design or fabric so anyway yeah. that's what i'm actually working on now so you shift from masks and your masks are you have great fabrics they're not these ugly n95 masks they're well i basically just took fabric that i had a bunch of that i didn't care about that much because my good collage fabric i I wasn't willing to use for masks and um and also for some reason the k facet fabric seems to be thinner and the Philip Jacobs, those are brands that have the big flowers and stuff. And um, so I, I just, and you, it's easier to take stuff that you have yardage of, so you could just multitask and right. cut and do 20 masks at once or something. So, mm. so I, I'll, I'll do masks again when my niece goes back to the hospital in Montana. I'm going to have stockpiled a bunch of masks to take when she goes and. Um, and my nephew works at a grocery store, and he was wanting some for his other employees there. So oh, Bozeman, it was weird that the store yeah. wasn't providing them. The store doesn't even ask their employees to wear masks, and they don't make the customer wear masks. It's crazy. Yeah. But anyway, but some of them want masks, and if I can make fun masks, then other people want to use them. Then that, be, yeah, that's right. Then that helps, and if they're comfortable. So mm -hmm. anyway, I like doing that. But masks are easy. I mean, the thing is, sometimes I think it was so stressful when we got up here that it was easier to figure out masks and make masks than to try to do my collage stuff because that just takes more concentration. And I, I think we were really stressed. Yeah. yeah. And so more um, than we knew. More than we knew. Yeah. My mm -hmm. gosh, it just feels like we've been eating, eating, and mm -hmm. yeah. So. Um, Maybe things are, maybe that's a sign that things are calming down a little bit, that I want to go back to my collage and other things like that. Mm. Yeah, the master, it's fun to have something that gives you a routine. Right. I think where I find that is I've changed how I practice my guitar in the last week or so, and I'm learning a, a new song that my teacher, Steve Netsky, got chords and arranged for me. And it's a James Taylor song, The Water is Wide. And instead of just playing the, the song through in a practice session and then switching to other songs, I, yesterday I spent a half an hour just playing the first four lines of the song and memorizing the words and memorizing the chords and just playing it over and over. And part of me is thinking, well, this is a, you'll never learn the song if you're gonna spend this much time on four lines. But the repetition of it was pleasurable. You know, you're, you you just play it, and it starts coming into muscle memory, and I know exactly what the next chord is, and and, uh, and there's just that pleasure of doing something simple. It's probably stress relieving. Mm -hmm. I think it is. Some people find it boring, but sometimes it's because your mind can think about other things, and yeah. I don't know. It just. Uh, well, what do we know about Sophie that we didn't know a month ago? <laughs> she is a bundle of energy, and when she's on, she's like a top that's being spun. She's racing around the house, seeing what she can chew on and pull out, and she's hilarious and a bit destructive. Um, 
and when she's down, she's out. Yeah, right. <laughs> she's just like totally. I think a bomb could go off and she wouldn't notice. <laughs> well, I've noticed these episodes where she sort of turns into a, a little pint-sized Yeti where she gets up on her back feet and and it, the ferocity of it. She's growling, and I don't remember Claire ever doing that or no, Yorkie. Uh, but, that she but she's just, she's playing with you when she does it. But somebody, uh, Sarah, came into the house yeah. the other day, and and Sophie went crazy. She just but was, was it the same mode? Or no, she was, she was terrified, like, and she huh. you know she ran from one side of the cottage to the other, and she kept looking back at Sarah and barking and kind of a cackly barking yeah. stuff and. Um, she was terrified, and Sarah. I had to give Sarah some food, and Sarah sat down on the floor and finally lured her over. It, I mean, it didn't really take that long. Yeah. But um, and Sarah didn't even have a mask on. I think this. You know, we aren't being able to. Well, to, that's right. It's uh, not the best. Uh, socialize her, mm -hmm. and we. Uh, now I noticed somebody came into the cottage yesterday. Moira was over, and she had a mask on. And at, at the time that it took for. Sophie to go um, back to being a calm dog was a lot quicker. Wow. And again, I gave her treats, and she kept giving her treats. And is that because she saw Sarah the other day, or? I think. Uh, well, I guess what's happening is every time somebody comes, and she starts seeing that, oh, that means you know I might get a treat, or yeah. these people are friendly. Oh, I see. Yeah. I don't know. When we took her to the vet, and they had to like rip her out of the car. I mean, they tried to do it nice, but they had to put a towel around her because she was so upset and yeah. take her out of the car. They had masks on. It really scared her. Oh, I see. And um, yeah. we got to do that again on Friday, so I don't yeah. know. Some trauma is creeping yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. I think people look weird in masks. Yeah. You know, that's part of it. <clears throat> and uh, so, anyway. She's now got the plastic fence, and she's... You know, pulling it around pulling and it around. biting on it, and she's. We should send a video with this. <laughs> Does she weigh two pounds yet? Yeah, she weighs. Well, she weighs uh, over two pounds, but she had. Um, we had to take her in. She had diarrhea, and we had to get her antibiotics and stuff. And I think during that time she lost weight. Oh. Now she's. Yeah, she's up to two pounds three ounces, and. And her appetite's good. Her appetite is ferocious. <laughs> she could eat nonstop, and she's. Her nose is to the floor all the time we're in the kitchen yeah. hoping that something will drop which is a little nerve wracking right right you don't want her to get a piece of onion or something like that would really not be yeah. good for a dog so small but yeah. she's wonderful i mean i love how she lays on my lap and yeah. how she follows me around and watches me and um comes when she's called so she's looking at the birds she's looking at she's very curious well, I'm not often wrong, but I was wrong about that it was a bad idea to get a puppy during a pandemic. Turns out oh, we been, haven't gotten sick, and it's been a good distraction. Well, anything could change, but it's been wonderful. Yeah. And uh, and these little dogs take so much time, right. and we have the time to watch and mm -hmm. work with her. Yeah. What else have we learned about the pandemic? It's been over two months that we've been up here. Well, you know, you always look back, and I, I'm sad about the time that we've been away from the kids, and you know, and you kind of think, well, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad at first. We could have stayed, and we could have been around them, and come later, and uh, maybe we wouldn't didn't have to leave Denver so soon. We could have, you know, been more conscientious of the stuff we packed up and brought, or I don't know. It's just it's hard not to because yeah. nothing has happened to us. You know, yeah, you sort of right. go back and. Um, but I, I, I mean, I think mostly I just feel so grateful to be here where we can walk around, we can bike ride, yeah. you know, we're by the ocean, um, and we're together and we're healthy, yeah. you know, and I, so I feel pretty good about that. We're learning things about each other. Yeah. I mean, you think that more than I do. I mean, I mean, I've been living with you for thirty you, not five no years, you know. Here. So it's not that it's not surprises, but you know. <laughs> it's that there's nowhere to hide. I guess, but I mean. You get the full Monty version of each pe other. People are sort of the same after you've been together for thirty-five years. I mean, you pretty much know what the other person's patterns are, and that's true. Um, you, I, yeah, I just sort of think you know, life goes on and. 
Yeah. I don't know. It does feel like an opportunity. I don't know what it's an opportunity for, but probably years from now we'll look back and say, hmm, that was when this happened. Well, yeah. say that's when we got a puppy. I mean, it's interesting because we mostly just spend the time together and I in some ways I mean it's not as much of a change for us yeah because we're here we're together if we were to De- with Denver we'd be together we'd be you know I mean there's stress about it and we feel the stress and I it comes out in weird ways but the other part I mean if you were you know a young family yeah and both people worked and the kids were in school um that their lives are totally changed right but ours it doesn't you know yeah we changed location and right uh, but we're doing the same stuff that we did before i mean we're not going out and you know having lunch with people doing things with people so there's yeah, but Probably. we didn't do that that much. We didn't do much. that much before either, especially me. You, you had a lot more contact with people than I did. Not that much. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I just, I, you know, I, I think that there's people that's lives are really, right. yeah, really we struggling. And, and we're not those people. Yeah. We're kind of the retired people that, yeah. you know, if we, if we didn't feel like we could go for bike rides and yeah. walks and... I mean, I remember in Cambridge, before we left, going into the grocery store when, you know, you were talking to your guy and, you know, you... Jerry Riddle. Jerry Riddle, and yeah. we, you know, we seemed to be more aware of what was going to happen than a lot of the people were, and but people were panicking and, you know, being in the grocery line like it was Thanksgiving when you knew you probably shouldn't be around people. And you were like two inches away from them in these huge windy yeah. lines with everyone's carts, you know, just brimming with food. Right. And um, so you were in the grocery store for, I don't know, an hour or something in line just trying to get out. And I remember thinking, we can't do this. Yeah. I mean... You know, you're turning 70 this year. We can't, this is not a safe environment for us to be in. And that's, I remember when I really thought we should be up at the beach. Yeah. Because, and I'm really grateful. I mean, we don't go to grocery stores now at all. We're so lucky to have deliveries or to the curb pickup. And Yeah, and you go to that one place and they bring it out to the car. Yeah, they're fabulous. Mm -hmm. The local post office, we go to the little Ocean Park post office and she comes out and gets Takes, the package. We, yeah, we leave her a check and she... She fills it in. Yeah, we yeah. leave the stuff in the trunk. She mm-hmm. puts the other stuff in the trunk, takes that out. Sue, yeah. She's fabulous. So, I mean, we're, we are very, very lucky. Yeah. We don't know what it's going to look like. There's family coming up usually in the summer here, but the rules of the beach and uh, two weeks of quarantine for anybody that comes out of state not really clear what, how strict that is, but you just don't know what the summer's going to look like. Right. James McCrivey the other week said he thinks it's going to look a lot like this, that no matter what the rules are of opening, the reality of avoiding people f- because you don't want to get the coronavirus, that's not really going to change. I think that's probably true. I mean, there's certainly a lot more pressure with people coming up because you, it's, you really want to spend time around them. Yeah. And... Um, so, but then we have to negat- navigate how that's going to work and yeah. how how to spend time around them in a way that feels safe to us and safe to them. And I mean, the, the goal is still not to get this. That's right. I and mean, you, can, you can get lulled into some complacency when you've had so long of not even a sniffle or a cough. Right. And I wonder if we're less susceptible to getting a cold because we're washing our hands all the time now. But, you know, we don't even wash our hands that much. When I heard that man say that he yeah, washes oh, gee, 50, 50 times, times a, day. a day, I mean, I maybe wash my hands five times a day because we're just here with yeah. us. We're not around anyone. We're just sort of carrying on like normal. Mm-hmm. So um, that may be something that if we are around, around more people, we're going to have to really yeah. be much more conscious right. about washing our hands. Yeah, and we've been wearing the masks on the bikes because sometimes oh, yeah. on the trail you're you're closer than six feet from some jogger that you're going past. Yeah, uh, you're huffing and puffing, and 
practice. Yeah, no, we, we... It's good practice. But most of the people you see here are not wearing masks, and it's because nobody... You're not close to anyone. I mean, we yeah. might... We rarely have one person walking on the road in front of us at, at a time. Right. More than one person. Yeah. It's usually a couple or something with their dog walking, and then... Yeah. Ten minutes later, another person goes by, so... Yeah. And that's hard because it's part of me thinks, well, we need to just be wearing our masks when we're out like that, just as a routine, you know, mm -hmm. just so and we kind of a model, you know. Oh, I mean. So it becomes a habit. I mean, so mm -hmm. many times we've left and said, oh, we don't have our mask. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard. It's, you know, you want to give people the right to do whatever they want to do. I just don't want them to infect me. <laughs> I, mean, I think they have a right to, yeah. you know, make whatever choices they That's want. That's right. Yeah. But and you negotiate. I mean, you, fi you find out where people are coming from in terms of how seriously they're taking it. And then that gives you, like, you know, my daughter Sarah and Josh and James, they've been very careful. And I think we're going to be probably comfortable. Well, she was in the house the other day. Yeah, and right. Because and we know they've been so careful, then they can become part of our inner circle, too. Part of our bubble, yeah. Our bubble, yeah. Well, and interesting, the woman who helps us opening open the cottages, she's been really conscientious about wearing her mask because she has asthma, so mm -hmm. she's, that's really good for us. Yeah. That she's taking it seriously. And, right. Because then we can help do things and yeah. don't have to keep our distance yeah. so far. It's such a weird time. Some of it's so calm and orderly, and and then there's this drumbeat of crisis. You know, the the medical side and the economic side. I mean, I think that's the part that's harder to see in the future. Is is it going to be a Great Depression? Is it going to bottom out in a way that doesn't wreck the country for five years? We just don't know. Right. Right. Yeah, and what to do. Yeah. When to open up, when not to open up. It's all, it's really tough questions. Yeah. So, but I mean, I, I, I think both Massachusetts and Maine are being pretty conservative on it, and I am really grateful for yeah. that. My friend in, that's in Naples, Florida, I mean, they're, they've just opened up everything, and uh, people aren't wearing masks, and, um, I just, I worry for their safety because right. they're older and they're out. And they said going to Costco is the only time they wear masks to the grocery stores. Hmm. And that's just how it is. Wow. So um, I, I, I feel really grateful that we're in states that are taking it very seriously. Yeah, me too. I saw there was a ranking of uh, approval ratings for governors and Baker, Charlie Baker, who's the governor of Massachusetts, I think he was like second or third on the list. He's, hmm. People just really think he's doing a good job. He seems very calm and informed, and he's following the science, and he's really relying on all of the incredible resources that Boston and Massachusetts has in the medical community and in the universities. And you just have a feeling of confidence that he's doing a good job. That's great, yeah. Yeah, and I think the main governor is doing a really good job. I don't know how... Pe totally how people are feeling about that because yeah. there's a lot of people that uh, resisting it yeah yeah there are are some people resisting it I don't know that there's a lot mm. but um, but I, I think she's I think she's doing a great job and there's a, a the doctor that comes yeah, on every sort day of Maine's Dr. Fauci talks every day at two on yeah. Maine Public Radio and just very calm presence and tells how many cases there are and how many are yeah. hospitalized how many recovered and just yeah. takes it step by step and he, he's so calming well and the other thing that the place i've seen the result of good communication is the place where dad lives you know it's a retirement community of i don't know 250 people and every day at 10 the the director of the community and her boss i think get on the closed circuit TV so that everybody can watch and dad watches it every single day religiously and she just says exactly what they're doing you know and the other day that they said now the people on the sixth floor can leave at two to go out for a walk on the patio and they had this kind of measured way of them finally being able to get out of their uh, units and and there were two benefits I think one is I think I can tell that he's calmer and the other thing is he says 
we're a community here. We're we're doing the right things, whether it's using a Kleenex to press the button on the elevator to not leaving the, the unit. We're doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for each other because we feel like we're a community. Mm -hmm. And you can really see the power of that. And obviously, there's a real challenge to do that at a state level, never mind a, a national level. But it's, uh, it's one of the saddest things, I think, is that you know when you get beyond dad's community that sense of community breaks down because people are so divided and it, it's it's tragic and i think it makes it harder to do the right thing in this environment yeah but people ultimately are worried about their own health i mean i yeah. see that with people who are Trump supporters and well, yeah, uh, Dad's a Trump supporter, and yeah. there's there's no disconnect in what he's seeing on uh, from from kind of an ideological point of view and how rigorously he's following the protocols. Yeah, and I see it with other friends of my back friends of mine back in Colorado, and and even friends on the street here. Yeah. Um, um, we have a neighbor on the end of the street that has huge mm -hmm. Trump signs and. Trump thing on her car and all this kind of stuff and her husband has some kind of le leukemia and he has so he has his immune system is compromised and yeah. they're being very careful they don't go anywhere they keep their distance right. I don't really see them in mass but they're just very very vigilant yeah and, and I think the other side is probably true the people who all right so Democrats I, I feel like when we can get takeout at a restaurant and support some businesses trying to get back and going I mean oh absolutely the, the the individuals care about both things. They care about the economy getting going, and they care about being safe. Absolutely. And yeah. So. Yeah. No, I. Sense. Yeah, and I think it's really important to really tip the people well, mm -hmm. and to. Um, yeah. Yeah, to do everything we can to to help them because it's it's really. We gotta get through this together. Yeah, we have to. Well, this is wonderful. I could just sit here all morning and talk to you in the sun with our coffee and tea. No, but I'm not sure what this has to do about the Kindle or anything or technology about the Oasis. or anything. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. we we tied it to the Kindle enough to have it justify for an interview. Yeah, Len loves technology. I I I don't like technology and. We're a perfect match because he can do the technology. I can get your Zoom meetings going <laughs> Get for my you. Zoom meetings get going. Get your books on your new Kindle. Yeah, I get my book on tape And going. you get a free new Kindle from a listener of the Kindle Chronicles. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was so great. Yep. Much anyway. appreciation to Al. Yeah. Sent it up here and it got here to the post office and yeah. we let it sit for a few days to make sure it was safe. And yeah. Bob's your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got time to read some comments I'd like to catch up with. Uh, John Aga wrote on May 14th, Hi Len, today I pre-ordered the new Fire HD 8 Plus. That's the new tablet we talked about last week. He says, I purchased the 64 gigabyte model because of the storage space and because that version comes with 3 gigabytes of RAM and therefore I expect it to be even more responsive. When I pre-ordered the device, I also pre-ordered a Samsung 64 gigabytes micro SD card. I was uh, surprised to discover that there were no cases currently available on Amazon.com that would fit this new Fire device. I have purchased several Kindle and Fire devices over the years and there were at least a few cases available prior to their initial release. My expectation was that there had been some sort of coordination between Amazon and traditional case vendors. Apparently for the first time there will be no cases or other accessories until the day of release based on the Amazon response and he's got one that he received from Amazon uh, and that is very different and disappointing. Uh, well I agree it's different and disappointing and I assume it has to do with the uh, uh, coronavirus that as the resources get uh, shifted toward the all of the retooling and everything that's going on for the coronavirus we can't get tech support at 630 at the night and Friday and when a new tablet is released you don't have the accessories available that you normally would so I think we're seeing symptoms of that and uh, interesting thanks thanks to John for pointing that out 
Uh, Peter wrote from Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, Len, in a recent interview, perhaps with A.G. Riddle, there was an exchange about using the sun's UV rays rather than a device to sanitize parcels. That reminded me of the phone soap devices. The phone-sized ones have been around for a while, and the larger ones are coming out this summer. Of course, I have no idea how effective they are, uh, but he has a link, and you'll see that in the show notes. It's at phonesoap.com. Best wishes, and as always, many my many thanks for your podcast, Peter and Victoria. Well, thanks, Peter. Uh, I've seen those. I, I think Darlene ordered one, and I'm not sure we've tried it yet I, to put the uh, iPhone in it and have some protection uh, for, because I guess the UV really does have an effect on the virus, so worth worth checking out. Shimon Schott wrote on May 10th, Hi Len, the latest TKC podcast was really interesting for me as I also teach students online. I can confirm all the points that Josh made, such as the one about looking directly into the camera as opposed to the person on the screen. Now he's referring to my interview with Josh Booken, uh, who's at the Harvard Graduate School of Education working on uh, kind of emergency digital learning at Harvard uh, in the pandemic. So he talked a lot about Zoom and and the rest of it. Uh, Shimon continues, the last part of the conversation made me wonder about a thing I read in a recent essay by Jacek Dukaj. He's a Polish science fiction author, often called the spiritual successor to Stanislaw Lem. Recently, he's been more of an essayist and commentator. There is a new Netflix series called Into the Night, an edge-of-your-seat thriller loosely based on one of his stories. That sounds interesting. Uh, Anyway, he observed that despite what people are saying about how we're slowing down, in fact, many processes are speeding up, crises being being natural catalysts for change. A good example is drone-based package delivery. People laughed at that when it was first introduced, but no one will be laughing now when Amazon deploys it. Other examples are the transition to remote work and perhaps perhaps remote education. It will be interesting to see how much teaching changes after the pandemic. Best, Shimon. Uh, Yeah, I agree. There was a piece I saw somewhere. uh, Oh, it was uh, Stephen Levy's newsletter, Plain Text. Uh, Fascinating insights into how quickly major companies are switching to uh, working from home. Uh, Google expecting, I think, half of their workforce working from home. Twitter, all of their workforce. And the benefits of it, the, apparently there's productivity benefits and lifestyle benefits. It used to be that you would uh, offer three squares, as Stephen calls it, at Google and massages and all this stuff. It, you'd, you'd, you'd be luring people to work for your company by having this fantastic office setup. Well, it, it may be that after this, you're going to lure your company by having a, an incredibly well thought out work from home policy that enables people to stay connected and still be effective. And uh, you can move to your dream home and, and work from home. So these changes are coming quickly. And, and uh, I take Shimon's uh, point there. This is from Dan, who wrote on in, back in April, uh, Hi, Len. I enjoyed the podcast today. I love Overdrive. This is in reply to my interview with David Burley from Overdrive. Uh, Dan says, I borrow a lot of Kindle ebooks through them, and I do buy a bunch, too. I wish he had more information about the library Big Reads and Sales. That was a program that uh, they make... It make it possible for libraries to have a big read in their city, and everybody reads the same book. It's actually being done in some whole countries. I wouldn't be surprised if it helps sell books. In the past, it has opened me up to new genres and discover new authors that I never would have found or chosen on my own. Recently, they had chosen a book called Flat Broke with Two Goats. I never would have bought the book, but I enjoyed it and her writing style so much that I went searching for other books that she wrote with the intent to buy them and to follow her upcoming books. This is another way the program could help authors. One other thing I'd like to have asked about would have been about exporting Kobo highlights. As you said that you are you like highlighting a book, I love having all my highlights from books that I read. This helps me helps remind me later on what happened in a book. I love Amazon and I enjoy my Kindle, but I think I'd enjoy trying a Kobo, especially knowing that a portion of my purchase would be applied to my local indie store. The highlights are one thing that keeps me from buying a Kobo. Thanks for the podcast. It's certainly one that I look forward to each week. Uh, 
And uh, I, I replied to Dan, I, I think that that program that Kobo had with the independent bookstores through the American Booksellers Association was actually discontinued because it resulted in disappointing sales. And I think the indie bookstores were, uh, they, they thought Kobo was going to be uh, doing this with the big box stores and generating a, a lot of interest in it, and they never did. So uh, that's not a, currently a, a reason to buy a Kobo to have a way to benefit the indie bookstores. Uh, Dan followed up with another note. He wrote, Overdrive has always been an exciting company to follow. Besides yours, my other most looked forward to podcast is the Professional Book Nerds podcast, where the two hosts, creators, are Overdrive workers. Their podcast leans much more towards book recommendations than yours, but I do enjoy hearing their varying formats of author interviews and recommendations. And it's fun to hear any Overdrive information or behind-the-scenes things along the way. I'll have a link to that podcast. I did check it out, and it's well done, and uh, it looks like a, a, a podcast that people who follow the Kindle Chronicles might very well be uh, interested in checking out. <laughs> As I've said, I, I have just stopped listening to podcasts. Here I am making a podcast every week and so grateful for you for listening. But I, when I go on walks and when I'm doing the dishes I, it, it, in pandemic mode, I'm just less willing to multitask. And, uh, and so far, I haven't been driven to say, all right, I'm going to sit down in a chair and listen to a podcast while doing nothing else. It they they just aren't that much of a pull on me. I'd rather be reading a book or watching Billions or something like that. So uh, I'll be curious to see if I return to listening to podcasts, but uh, so far I'm not. I, I, I'm i glad. Well, <laughs> I don't know if there's fewer people listening to the Kindle Chronicles as a result, but uh, it, it does seem to be changing a lot of our habits. That's it for this week, and I'm not sure who I'll be talking. Oh, no, I do. I am sure who I'm talking to. I've got an author coming up who's written an intriguing book called The Voter File, and he's uh, the author has got some political experience, and it's about uh, hacking an election, and it's pretty well written, and it's quite dramatic. I'm reading it now, so we'll, we'll have a, a taste of uh, that story. Uh, it, it's coming out. Uh, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but it, it's a... Uh, Penguin Random House book and their publicist uh, signed me up to talk to them sometime next week. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles from Ocean Park, Maine. Thanks for listening. Bye.